Sergeants, if you can begin your recordings. Recording to the cloud, all set. PC recording is up. Back up is rolling. Excellent, thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I am council member Jimmy Van Bramer, chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations. And this important oversight hearing is now commenced. Today, we are here to conduct an oversight hearing on amplifying BIPOC and queer voices in the arts. While this is the committee's uh, first hearing focused specifically on this topic, the committee has held several hearings related to the topic of diversity, including our October 2020 oversight hearing on Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, structural racism, and the arts, and our September 17th, 2019 oversight hearing on diversity in cultural institutions and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, workforce demographics, pilot study findings, results, and next steps. We've also had uh, many meaningful uh, additional hearings this past year in particular, uh, focusing on this very important topic. I think everybody here knows discrimin discrimination, marginalization, and exploitation of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and the LGBTQ plus communities in the form of institutional inequities are unfortunately nothing new. It is important that we not only change the narrative to center and lift up voices of color and queer folks, uh, but also work to ensure that BIPOC and LGBTQ artists work is centered in the conversation. Additionally, we must ensure that those in power's action mirror the conversations being held. We have now held several hearings touching on the devastating effects of COVID-19, the pandemic and its effect on the arts and culture sector. Uh, we all know here, it, it is the second hardest hit with regard to employment loss after restaurants. The sector continues to struggle and within it, some groups much more than others. Uh, and yet, we all know that any recovery, particularly a just recovery, uh, knows that uh, arts and culture uh, must lead that recovery. Arts and culture practices are among the most impactful ways to affect social change, explore uh, racial and ethnic representations, reflect a community's history and identity, and provide an opportunity to engage diverse audiences in transformative learning. And there is so much more the city can do to amplify those voices and support uh, these artists and cultural organizations, uh, much more so than we are already doing. I'm proud to have spent my uh, career at the council fighting for equitable funding uh, for artists and organizations and last year with historic budget cuts looming uh, in the middle of the pandemic's worst days, uh, I gave it everything I had and we'll do the same this year. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who is sharing testimony today and who is submitting written testimony for sharing your stories and helping to explain exactly why this is so important. Structural racism exists in everything from the lack of diversity in museum leadership to a potential lack of arts education opportunities in black and brown communities. And even over a half a century 
after the Stonewall Rebellion, we continue to fight for equity and equality for our LGBTQ plus uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, we must recognize and address systemic racism and discrimination with improved systems and practices developed for racial equity across all fields and sectors, and in doing, centralize the voices of these communities. We are here today because we truly believe BIPOC and queer voices in the arts provide transformational opportunities for everyone. This is and should be a beginning and a continuation of the discussions and the work that so many of you have been involved in for your entire lives. So I wanna thank everyone uh, for doing the work each day uh, as we work to create and design equity into all aspects of our public life. And as the council seeks to understand how to better amplify the impact of BIPOC and queer voices within the cultural community and beyond. Uh, I appreciate, we appreciate your passion, uh, partnership and time. I will also say that as we've held these hearings, the discussions have been incredibly moving and impactful. And, um, and I thank everyone for, for sharing so much of themselves uh, during these uh, difficult days and these important hearings. So I look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, I know we're gonna start with uh, Department of Cultural Affairs Commissioner Gonzalo Casals, uh, who uh, I know feels very, very strongly um, about uh, this. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief staff, Matthew Wallace, the committee's principal financial analyst, Alia Ali, our policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney uh, for uh, all of their work as well. And I should recognize my council colleagues. Um, if I miss anyone, hopefully the staff can text me, but I certainly see council member Darn Diaz who is here. I thought I saw council member Mark Joni um, on the call. And if I scroll through the boxes, I might see others, but as the hearing uh, goes along, I'm sure there'll be more council members joining us and we will recognize them at that time. Yes, confirmation that council members Diaz and Joan are on the call at this moment. Uh, so once again, thank you all uh, for being here and I will pass it to uh, Brenda McKinney, uh, our counsel to the committee to uh, go through the formalities and the logistics of how we're going to proceed from here. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Brenda McKinney, as the chair mentioned, the committee, um, the Council of Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. So uh, we're just going to start with some administrative matters. So before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After I call on you, you'll be unmuted by the host. And please note that a box pops up. You have to accept to unmute. Uh, please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Council member questions today will be limited to five minutes. And council members, please note that includes both your questions and the witness answers. Please also note that we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing, but these will be limited to three minutes. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist for the public should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And you will be called on after everyone in that panel has um, completed their testimony in the order that you raised your hand in Zoom. Uh, finally, all public testimony today will be limited to three minutes. So we will be using a three minute clock. After I call your name, Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce you may begin and start the clock before starting your testimony. We'll remind you of this throughout the hearing. So with that, um, we will move to the administrative the administration and the administration testimony portion of this hearing. So I will now call the following members of the administration to testify. Uh, Mr. Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs. 
Ms. Sheila Feinberg, Deputy Commissioner from the Department of Cultural Affairs, and Ms. Pranita Raghavan, General Counsel from the Department of Cultural Affairs. So I will deliver the oath to all three of you, and then I'll call upon each of you individually to respond to that oath. So if you can please raise your right hand. The camera, thank you so much. Do you affirm to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, um, the, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions today? Commissioner Casals. I do. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Feinberg. I do. Thank you. And General Counsel Raghavan. I do. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, Commissioner Casals, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you and good morning. <clears throat> good morning, Chair Van Bremer and members of the committee. I'm Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner of Cultural Affairs for the City of New York, here to testify on today's topic, amplifying by POC and queer voices in the arts. I'm joined today by Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg and General Counselor Pranita Ragavan. I'm a believer in cultural democracy, meaning everyone has the right to participate in the cultural life of their community, to see themselves reflected in it, and has agency to create and practice culture as they, as they define it. In New York, culture knits together communities of all sorts. It is a powerful connector, no matter where you are. But, you, but for historically oppressed people like BIPOC and queer New Yorkers, art is an indispensable source of community uplift and enrichment. The social impact for the arts study that my agency helped bring to New York demonstrated that in underserved neighborhoods, cultural assets correlate with improved public safety, health, and education. Culture is important to all New Yorkers, but for these communities that have suffered for the, from decades of low investment, systemic racism, and other forms of exclusion and bias, the arts are essential. This is why for years, the Department of Cultural Affairs has made it a top priority to foster a more, di more diverse, equitable, and inclusive, inclusive cultural sector. Starting in 2015, under my predecessors, Tom Finkerpel, the agency launched an effort to promote a more diverse cultural workforce, fostering a cultural workforce that looks like the residents of our city, including historically underrepresented by POC and queer residents, is a major step towards building institutions that engage with, speak to, and reflect the full beauty and breadth of New York City's community. This effort has built on advocacy and reform work stretching back decades. Early successes of these movements include the establishment of some of our city's first culturally specific organizations, like Studio Museum and El Museo del Barrio. We're proud to follow in these footsteps today as we work with cultural advocates and organizers from every corner of the city. The data and knowledge that we have collectively gathered in recent years have been transformed into powerful tools for change by the cultural workers who are committed to driving progress and by institutions that are increasingly understanding and embracing the role in making change. The Create NYC Cultural Plan released in 2017 give our sector an opportunity to talk to thousands of New, York's, New Yorkers directly about what they need and wanted from their cultural community. And it led to the creation or expansion of a number of programs aimed at elevating by POC and queer voices in the New York City arts community. Two such examples include the Creating, Creating YC Language Access Fund, which provided 36 nonprofit with grants ranging from 5,000 to 25,000 in support of programming that increases access to arts and culture for those whose primary language is not English. The awarded programs represent 12 languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Russian, and American Sign Language, and serves audiences in all five boroughs. The CUNY Cultural Course, which has placed over 600 CUNY students in paid positions with cultural organizations, including more than 200 in the current year, even with the widespread closures by the pandemic. The program gives cultural groups access to diverse pool of talent at CUNY and gives the students an opportunity to gain their first experience in the cultural sector, paving the way for long-term positions. These new efforts join long-standing collaborations with the City Council to invest in BIPOC organizations like the Coalition of Theater of Color, which in FY21 provided $3.74 million to support theater groups of color. 
the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, which has been a long champion by um, Chair Van Bremer, is providing another 6 million in the current fiscal year for groups that are led by and work with our city's extraordinary immigrant communities. In the city's permanent public art collection, we made strides in commissioning work by and about people that were excluded for too long from our public spaces. A recent internal review found that the agency has commissioned 84 permanent artworks by or honoring underrepresented communities. This range from Alison Sars' famous tribute to Harriet Tubman in Harlem, the upcoming monument to Shirley Chilson in Brooklyn, and now that public art projects are being restarted following COVID-related COVID -related pauses, the monuments honoring Shirley Chilson and Tinto Puente, as well as the Victory Beyond Sims monument, have all been restarted. A city as diverse as New York needs to have a public art collection that reflects the people who have shaped its history and institutions. DCLA Public Art is in Residency, or PER, program integrates creative practice into municipal government. Working in a city government serving a majority of BIPOC population, these artists have naturally focused on engaging and elevating these populations. Two of the current artists are working with the Commission on Human Rights. Amanda Pingbodi Bakia has now created two powerful projects. The first launched last fall is called I Still Believe in Our City, a campaign combating the bigotry against Asian and Pacific Islander residents and letting everyone know that they are an integral part of New York. The other project, May We Know Our Strength, launched earlier this month in the Meatpacking District. It invites sexual assault survivors to share their stories via website which are then printed and woven into a larger paper sculpture. Each evening at 8 p.m. during the installations run through mid-May, the artist holds a visual honoring the Asian women murdered in Atlanta last month. Andrew Wagner, a photographer also working with the Commission of Human Rights, kicked off this project last month with portraits of black restaurant owners in central Brooklyn, highlighting their importance as community hubs and resiliency throughout the pandemic. We know that culture is critical to communities in need, and especially so in times of crisis. In the spring of 2020, DCLA conducted a survey of the pandemic's impact on our cultural sector. The report found that smaller and community-based groups were hardest hit, along with teaching artists. So we're directed, we directed additional funds based on these findings, investing in groups that are crucial parts of their communities during a period of tremendous need of uncertainty. We conducted a follow-up survey, survey earlier this year and results will be released later this spring. There tends to be a significant overlap between smaller groups and by POC organizations. Altogether, over 500 CDF recipient organizations had budgets under $250,000, half of the grantee pool. This year, we have also moved forward with reforms and efforts to make CDF funding more equitable. This include expanding multi-year funding to all grantees to provide greater predictability and stability in support, streamlining the CDF application, developing strategies to recruit panelists that are representative of our city's diverse population, and incorporating equity in CDF priorities and criteria for funding. <clears throat> Excuse me. The agency's primary role continues to be supporting and advocating for the cultural nonprofits that together are the backbone of New York City's cultural vitality. vitality. Apologies for that. Our efforts to foster or a more diverse workforce and distribute public funds more equitable are, in the end, intended to support cultural programming that captures, connects with, and represents all New Yorkers. Our cultural community has been doing this work for years a foundation we're building on the make, on to make further progress. Whether it's working with the cultural institutions group on strategies to adopt equitable practices or increasing investments in groups serving diverse communities citywide, the programming and missions of these organizations are where the real values lies for New Yorkers. The last year has shown us once again, how essential culture is to our communities and where it needs the greatest support to be part of a holistic approach to addressing generations of systemic racism and disinvestment. We're proud of the work we have done with our collaborators, including the city council, and we recognize how much farther we have to go. We continue to participate in active ongoing conversations about how to move forward together to build a better, more equitable cultural sector. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have.
Thank you, Commissioner uh, Casals, for your testimony today and your work. Uh, I want to recognize that Majority Leader Lori Cumbo has joined us and um, just start off by saying uh, I'm, thank you for recognizing the council's work and, and leadership on the, um, on the CLT and Cultural Immigrant Initiative, uh, uh, Coalition of Theaters of Color, uh, something that uh, Majority Leader Cumbo uh, and I have uh, continued to partner on and fight for, um, and I'm very proud uh, of the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, which is uh, the first uh, uh, funding stream created for uh, immigrant run and led uh, cultural organizations uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, smaller budget organizations. Um, and uh, those are good positive steps, but of course there is so much more work uh, to do uh, to truly achieve the equity uh, that we're all looking for. So, um, along with your cat who's made an appearance, I see Commissioner Casals, um, want to ask you uh, a, a couple of, you know, bigger questions and then um, ask you a few more detailed questions. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Majority Leader Cumbo uh, will have some, some uh, thoughts and questions as well. But when, when we think about amplifying uh, BIPOC and queer voices, uh, what are the biggest barriers uh, to amplifying uh, those voices in your opinion? And, and now that you've been the, the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs for, I guess, the year and two months or so, obviously through an incredibly difficult time, but what barriers do you see at the agency that you were once on the other side of for uh, many years in your career, but now the agency that you helm. And, and uh, so your thoughts on those two particularly sort of big overarching questions uh, before we get into some more specifics. Thank you for that question, um, Chair Van Bremer. Um, I believe that for as long as we continue to live on a society that upholds uh, white supremacist values, um, and I'm talking about the system as a whole, not necessarily specific individuals, there's always going to be a lot of work for not only uh, the administration and the council, but um, all our cultural organizations to continue to do work to amplify the voices of um, these cultural organizations and in turn of these um, communities. Um, the, uh, the, the challenges um, that we face individually um, or specifically as, as an agency is um, very similar to the challenges that we face as we um, confront um, the recovery of our city, right? This is a problem that is bigger than our city, is bigger than each of us, and of course is bigger than our um, agency. And, um, and in many cases, um, the problems that arise um, in the lack of rep representation of um, um, culturally specific organizations, organizations that serve by POC um, communities and queer communities are not necessarily solved um, with funds, right? Um, always funding is, is welcome um, by our cultural organizations, but sometimes um, we need a, a shift in the values that we uphold in our society. Um, the uh, agency is gonna continue to work to internally and externally to, um, um, to continue to um, re revisit our policies and make sure that the access to public funds, um, the barriers that you know, are in, in the process of accessing to public funds are being removed, like some of the ones I mentioned um, just now, um, but, but the work continues and, and we're committed to do that um, for as long as I'm, I'm here and for as long as um, this administration is here. So, you know, I, I think a lot of folks know uh, you, Commissioner Casals, and know of your, your work and your, your, your uh, affiliation with institutions um, like Leslie Lohman and Museo and, and others. And, and there are a lot of folks who, who might think, wow, I mean, Gonzalo is, is you know, a queer Latinx, you know, wildly progressive uh, person who 
you know, it, it, it might not get better than this in terms of having a commissioner who, uh, who, who feels this. And, and I guess the question is, as that person now in this role, um, how much change do you think you, you can affect? Uh, can you um, meaningfully change things? Obviously, you, you, you uh, work with a, a mayor and a city hall and, and a city council. And, and so it is not just you. I, I know that. But, but, you know, and maybe this is a sort of an existential question, right? But, but uh, <laughs> how, how much, how much, how much, but, but, you know, I do think people are rightfully so wanting, you know, more change, right? And, and, and much more quickly and, and, and much more equity because there has so much uh, uh, inequity baked into the system. And, and uh, so, your thoughts on on that, right? I mean, how it, it's 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 a big ship to turn around, right? And uh, and you've been given that that task, and uh, uh, and and uh, can you meaningfully impact the system while you're you're here? Yes, uh, I mean that's a super big question with so many parts. Uh, a couple of things. One is um, you don't only have to be queer, Latinx, immigrant. Um, I may add, you know, in order to do this work and to believe in this work, it's about the values that you uphold. Of course, you know, I'm proudly subscribing to those identities and to those communities. Allow me to. Um, um, have a much more empathy for um, the situation in which many of these communities are. Um, I like to believe that this administration and in particular this mayor um, pick somebody like me with um, not only the identities, but the work that I have done um, as a commissioner because he um, upholds these values and, and supports um, these communities and they're important to him. Um, but again, um, you don't have to, you know, subscribe to a marginal group or to a minority group in order to um, to do, be doing this work. What I what I've said, you know, is that uh, um, ma most of this work also has to be done and be taken the lead. But um, those are like on the, in the mainstream. In terms of um, change and the ability to 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 create change, um, you know, in a in an infrastructure, but also in a society that uh, has so much inertia, right? Over 400 years of uh, white supremacy, um, I like to um, just to point out as something very attainable, and you know, that we can all see is just to go back um, six seven years ago when my predecessor Tom Finkerpel install the conversation um, from the perspective of a um, city administration about uh, looking at the diversity of our sector. And that the impact that it has had is not only about you know, the data that we collected, that we all, nobody was surprised to see that there was a huge inequity in terms of you know, who gets to define arts and culture for New York City, but if a conversation has been installed and probably you and I were having this conversation today, this morning, because of you know having that my predecessor and this administration bringing these ideas of equity, diversity, and inclusion um, to the forefront. And, and a lot of has changed, right? Is it moving as fast as society is moving, mostly in the last year and a half? Probably not. But uh, what is also important in these um, issues is to be authentic. And some people talk about the idea of moving at the speed of trust, right? As, as a city administration, we wanna make sure that every step that we make is a step that is sustainable, that is meaningful, and that is done in collaboration um, with the communities that we're trying to serve. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Casals. <clears throat> I see council member Jim Gennaro has uh, join the hearing. Uh, I want to recognize him. And uh, also, uh, I think that Commissioner Finkel Pearl uh, deserves a, a lot of credit for beginning the conversation. Um, I also just want to recognize, though, uh, that the, the council, uh, Councilmember Levin, and I wrote the uh, 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 cultural plan uh, uh, law, which produced uh, the Create NYC. Uh, 
uh, work and, and I believe has produced some, some uh, incremental and, uh, but tangible results um, in, in, this, uh, in this area. And, uh, and, and Sarah, know, Primer, if you allow me, I just wanna make sure we both are, are clear on these before anybody else at us, right? When I said that he started the conversation, I said it you know, from the perspective and from the platform of city administration, right? There has been a lot of people talking about these issues for many, many decades before that happened. Yes, uh, I, I understood uh, that already when uh, you said that. Um, uh, so I know you said that funding is, is just a part of this uh, and, and of course it is, uh, but it is a very important part of, of this. And, and there are many on this, uh, in this hearing, in this virtual hearing, um, who will uh, speak later and and speak to some of these issues, right? And the the uh, the inequities uh, baked into the CDF formulas and uh, the, uh, the 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 constant sort of tension, right, between uh, the larger, uh, wealthier. Uh, sometimes wider organizations um, and 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 you you mentioned it in your testimony right sort of getting into making CDF itself more equitable and and uh, and what does that look like now and 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 how how do we going forward um, build, a better system, right? And and what plans do you have right now uh, to to do that? Because I think that that's still an on, as you know, an ongoing uh, uh, conversation and one that's really important uh, to have. We've done some things, and again, the council right takes the lead on coalition with years of color, cultural immigrant initiative, uh, some of our other cultural initiatives, but that is a relatively small uh, piece of the uh, funding. Pi and uh, and CDF uh, is 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 so much uh, of it. So maybe just take that on as well. Yes, um, there uh, there are two aspects to this, right? You know, in addition to the uh, council initiatives, as I mentioned, and um, disability forward, language access, um, social impact of the arts, there are some um, ways in which. Um, we're targeting um, different aspects of um, the uh, cultural sector in order to give them the resources to um, continue to do the work that in turn, again, impact you know, the um, communities that we're talking um, today about. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's important to, um, to understand um, overall um, what are the, um, the, um, the barriers that existed or continue to exist in order to access public funds from, you know, the length and the amount of time that it takes you to fill out an application to apply for CDF to the way in which um, CDF applications need to be submitted. And um, my team has been doing this work for three years, really and, and trying to understand, you know, all those barriers, you know, like, and just piloting different um, um, initiatives. I'm, I'm proud that you know the the, the first three um, that we um, established um, this year um, had been received by the sector um, um, with um, great enthusiasm. As I said, you know, um, small organizations were not allowed to receive multi-year grants um, until last year. Starting um, this year, um, organizations under two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which makes fifty percent of our funding pool are able to receive um, multi-year grants. And, and there's a back and forth conversation, right? If you, give, um, if you get a multi-year grant, that means that for two or three years, you're gonna be always at the same funding level, as opposed as if you apply every other year, um, you might have an opportunity to get more funds. So there's a little bit of a cash 22, what's best or worse. Uh, we believe that you know, knowing how much money you're going to receive in, in the next two or three years is much more important in moments like this for sustainability. So we went with that. 
um, removing the uh, requirement uh, for organizations to have to fill out the CDP um, data arts um, um, application um, at the moment in which you are applying for funds has significantly cut back on the amount of time that one can uh, needs to um, spend um, um, filling out applications and and then you know um, adding um, specifically these two years um, um, a, a sort of a, an adjustment for those that are working with teaching artists and for those that are in hardest hit COVID um, areas has been ways of you know sort of a balance out or making our CDF program more equitable. We continue to work and to assess um, our program, and there's going to be hopefully more um, um, initiatives um, coming up down the pipe to continue to make, um, again, access to public funds um, more equitable and easier. Thank you. Um, I would like to open the floor up to my council colleagues. Um, if anyone has uh, questions uh, or comments for the commissioner, um, feel free to raise your hand or the committee council can let me know if anyone has any questions for Commissioner Casals. Um, and we don't see any hands raised. If there are any council members that have questions for the administration, um, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Okay, no sure. questions from my colleagues in the council for Commissioner Casals. Um, looks like you've uh, answered uh, <laughs> many of the questions, Commissioner Casals, uh, to uh, folks' satisfaction. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I will ask you then, um, obviously we're, we're in budget season and uh, the mayor has a proposed uh, budget. The council has responded to that proposed budget. Uh, the council uh, does raise culture and arts as a priority in uh, the budget. And there's a lot of talk about federal stimulus money, the, the state budget. Um, uh, it is needless to say, incredibly important to me. And I know uh, Majority Leader Cumbo will be in there fighting for all things culture and the arts. Um, and, but uh, how, how do you see the budget at this point from your vantage point and discussions within the administration? I also want to recognize Council Member Francisco Moya uh, has joined us. I believe the entire committee is here, but uh, uh, maybe just uh, share your thoughts on the overall budget and whether or not uh, some folks hope, uh, including myself, we might actually see uh, a restoration of some of the, the uh, cuts that we saw last year and maybe even more funding for culture and the arts this year. Um, unfortunately, and I feel I'm preaching a little bit to the choir, you know, it's a little too early to, to anticipate how the budget is going to look like. Um, I look forward also to the conversations with the council. Um, I believe in this specific um, um, item, which is arts and culture, um, everybody understands um, the uh, important role that our cultural organizations, our cultural workers, our artists have, not only in the recovery of the sector, but in the recovery of the city. The mayor has been uh, out there um, making sure everybody gets that message that uh, without the recovery of arts and culture, um, New York City cannot come back. And I look forward to um, continue to work with the council with you, Chair Van Bremer, with the Majority, Limbo, majority Leader Combo to um, make sure we arrive to, um, to um, a budget that um, really supports um, our sector and, and again, the recovery of New York City. Uh, I agree. And um, you called uh, her name and Majority Leader Combo uh, indeed uh, has a question for you or a series of questions. I was surprised that the majority leader wouldn't have- I try, to I try. <laughs> <laughs> I try, but I can't help myself. Um, this, this is not necessarily related to the hearing topic at hand, 
but I am curious as we're on our way out, um, Councilmember Van Bramer and I, uh, prior to you becoming the commissioner, had worked really hard on increasing the percent for art budget, um, almost doubling, almost tripling it, I would say. And I wanted to know, you know, given a lot of the challenges that we've had with COVID and those sorts of things, have you seen any, the, the goal of this was to really ramp up public art projects in the city of New York. Can you talk a little bit about how public art and funding for that has um, been impacted as a result of, I, I guess your tenure, COVID before and the future of where you see it going? Um, unfortunately, I don't have any specific numbers because I wasn't prepared to talk about these, okay. but I, I'm happy to tell you a couple of things. And that One, could be another hearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let me tell you, uh, and then we can always connect offline about these mm -hmm. uh, if you have any questions. Um, um, a couple of things. I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, the contracts for um, the, um, um, the uh, monuments honoring Tito Puente and Charlie Chilson had been signed, fully signed, and we're in the process that is ongoing. Um, I'm happy to report that after a long pause during COVID, um, the uh, the um, 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 artist who um, is creating victory for beyond uh, seams has received the contract. Um, there, she's reviewing that with her lawyer, and hopefully, as soon as we um, work out some of the uh, details, we can sign that that up, and the um, the um, monument could be on its way. Um, the uh, funding specifically um, for um, Percent for art is tied to um, construction. So as construction starts coming back um, on public um, capital projects, we're gonna see more um, public art coming back, but uh, we are also working internally to make sure that that unit is supported um, in a way that is um, significant. And I'm happy to report that we added um, one person to that unit to help with community engagement um, so the processes of creating public art and monuments for the city um, can be supported and um, by um, the um, uh, input of um, um, our um, New York, our fellow New Yorkers. Okay, one of one of the things that I had wanted to see as a result of that, and I think that goes back to Councilmember Van Bramer's initial question, um, because so many you know, with each commissionership and yours is so limited in terms of its timing, wants to usher in a new thing. And I think that one of the things that I really wanted to see was that there be more of a partnership with the Percent for Art program, with our public plazas, with our parks department, um, even potentially with our schools and utilizing those opportunities to create more public art um, forward facing with our libraries and so many other spaces um, where the people um, have an opportunity to have access to art. Also public housing has somewhat of a history of a relationship with public art. And so I think it would be really exciting to see more relationships with agencies connected to public art that have always kind of been in these silos of Parks Department does public art this way. It's separate from DCLA. DCLA doesn't do public art necessarily with NYCHA and NYCHA does, you know, to be able to integrate that so that public art could be more accessible to the people of the city of New York. Um, my next question, um, as Council Member Van Bramer brought up the budget, how is federal stimulus money um, impacting DCLA's budget and the organizations that it serves. Has there been some overarching conversation about that now that there's congressional federal money, there's also by member item, there's also funding as it pertains to stimulus money. Is there discussions from the administration about how stimulus money is going to directly impact um, the Department of Cultural Affairs? There are some initial conversations about, you know, programs that, you know, those uh, funds would uh, enable. And we, of course, uh, as I sit at the table, I try to figure out, you know, how we can take advantage um, of, of those funds. But uh, anyways, uh, any um, 
Anyhow, um, more funds for the city means more funds for all um, the work that we do. Um, can I finish? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, more funds for the city means you know more funds for all the work that we do, and, and we continue to work towards the the um, again the budget for next year. Um, and I'm confident that um, uh, as um, I said before the arts and culture is going to continue to play a big role in the recovery of our city. Um, I guess I'll, I'll let that go. I don't, I don't really quite understand the answer, but maybe through other questions it'll come up. And I guess finally, which is what, uh, again, Councilmember Van Bramer brought up, as this is your final official year as the commissioner, what do you feel that you would want your legacy to be as a commissioner? So for example, like with Tom Finkelpearl, the cultural plan, however people feel about it, adding Weeksville to the roster of SIGs and, and other things might be things that he would be associated with. Um, what do you feel that you would want your legacy upon completion as commissioner to say it has ushered in um, a specific element that had never existed before? Um, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, uh, and, uh, and throughout my career, I always measure the um, outcome in the process. It's not necessarily what you end up doing, it's how you do it and how do you involve others in doing it. And mm -hmm. I'm extremely, um, extremely proud of how we all came together in, in, a, in such a um, hard moment for our city. And how do we, while we all play our roles at the same time, we came together and we work together towards one wall goal, which is um, how do we support cultural organizations um, in the recovery of the sector, but also how do cultural organizations help the recovery of New York City? and being able to have open um, line of communication, working um, hand to hand and shoulder to shoulder, not only with the council, but also with the sector and the many multiple um, committees, task force and, and areas of the sector, I think is what makes me uh, proud of the work that we, we have done and I hope to continue to do. And I hope it continues beyond you know, the three of us being gone at the end of the year. You certainly have a future career on the political side, so I will, <laughs> but I appreciate sure your answer. That. You're good, you're good, Commissioner, you're good. Thank All right, I'll you. turn it back over to Chair Van Bramer. Thank you um, very much, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, and uh, uh, the dropping the legacy question uh, to Commissioner Casals um, is uh, something that the uh, a lot of folks are thinking about these days, uh, as uh, Gonzalo said, at the end of the year, when all three of us are gone, um, it's a little final, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, but uh, I, I hope that uh, all of us will continue uh, to be champions of uh, culture and the arts and uh, the values that we've all been fighting for, uh, even if we're not in uh, these identical positions at the end of the year. But um, uh, indeed, it's been uh, an incredible, uh, an incredible partnership. While uh, I've had the opportunity to chair this committee, uh, and and then when uh, the majority leader joined the council, and we had uh, uh, an incredible champion of the arts uh, join me uh, in these sometimes lonely fights, uh, and then of course uh, uh, you, Commissioner Casals, uh, in all the work that you do. So. Um, uh, so thank you. Uh, there's obviously, uh, you know, a million more questions uh, and so much more work to do, but we have many members of uh, the community who are here to speak and we want to move on uh, to the public unless any other council members have uh, any further questions for the commissioner and the administration. Uh, if we do not have that, um, I'll take a one minute break and then we will resume uh, Brenda McKinney with uh, testimony from our cultural community. Does that sound fair? That sounds great, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
Commissioner Casales, uh, I'll be right back. All right, so we are back. Brenda, do you want to call the first uh, panel? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. And we don't, I don't see any other hands. So if oh, we yes. conclude the administration portion of the hearing, just one more check for any other council member questions. And no hand, so um, we'll move on. Okay, um, and then uh, Chair, if we can just start with some more housekeeping items um, before we call the panel. So uh, now we will move to the public panel portion of the hearing. And now that we have concluded the administration's testimony, I'd like to remind everyone that um, as we call names, individuals will be called up in panels. So council members, as a reminder, if you have a question for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. You'll be called on after everyone in that panel has completed their testimony in the order that you raised your hand. And for panelists, members of the public, uh, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you go the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. As a reminder, all testimony will be limited to three minutes. We have a three minute clock today per individual. So please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Um, so with that, the first panel in order of speaking today will be Melody Capote from the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, Adam Odsas Rubin from the National Queer Theater, and I apologize in advance for any mispronunciation of names, Douglas Dubois Card, Seba Mala from the National Queer Theater, and Deborah Cowell, an artist who is also working with um, high arts. So uh, we will now call on our first witness, who is Melody Capote. You may begin once the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the City Council. My name is Melody Capote, Executive Director of the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute. I am pleased to be here as an African descendant Latina to lend my voice regarding systemic bias in the administration of arts and culture funds. Before I begin, I want to express my refusal to use the acronym BIPOC as this term in itself erases our identities as Asian, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx people. I come to tell you as clearly as I can that the system for funding arts and culture in the city of New York is both inherently and systematically biased against Black, Brown, Native, Asian, people of color, as well as against queer, my queer brothers and sisters. Let's be clear. Systemic racism does not require a deep level of motivation by the perpetrator. Edmund Burke said it best, the only necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I speak now of the Cultural Institutions Group 
or CIG as it is known. The CIG was created in 1876 in order to make New York into a showcase of culture. By 1900, major institutions like the American Museum of Natural History, the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art, the New York Botanical Gardens, the Bronx Zoo, and the Brooklyn Museum, among others, were given lucrative leases for a mere pittance. And of course, no institution of color was even considered. Now, 150 years later, only three institutions operated by communities of color have been granted entrance into the hollowed halls of CIG. This city council members is exactly what systemic racism looks like. It just happened. We couldn't find an indigenous or black institution qualified to be a member of CIG. Should we ask or wonder why not? Or do we know the answer? I am not here to argue that the CIG should be abolished. I am here to argue that in order to address the systemic and inherent bias caused by the way CIG has been funded, there is a need for immediate equitable distribution, much in the same way that phrases is used in divorce proceedings, that that phrase is used in divorce proceedings, pardon me. In order to fairly and equitably share the largest that was created 150 years ago. And when I say created, I'm talking about each of those institutions utilizing the services of native people, freed and indentured slaves whose contributions are now memorialized in little plots of land throughout the city called the African burial grounds. I respect most of the institutions that belong to CIG, but the institution itself needs to be reformed around a new and more equitable paradigm. Consider this, the CIG institutions lease property from, city of, from the city of New York for in some cases $1 and in other cases other token payments. My institution, the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, negotiated the purchase of a firehouse from the city for $1 and we raised and invested $10 million into it. In order to create the institution that exists today and for that $1, the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute is told that they, we cannot be a member of CIG and receive equitable distribution of the CIG funds. I leave you with this question. Are you kidding me? Thank you for your time. And yes, black lives do matter. Thank you, Ms. Jose, for your uh, testimony. Our next witness will be Adam Odess, Again, apologies, Odsess Rubin from the National Queer Theater. You may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Odsess Rubin, and I'm the founder and artistic director of National Queer Theater, New York's leading LGBTQ theater company. This pride, we are staging our third annual Criminal Queerness Festival outdoors and socially distant at LaGuardia Performing Arts Center in Queens and at Lincoln Center. The Criminal Queerness Festival provides a stage in our city to international and immigrant LGBTQ artists facing censorship and criminalization in their home countries. Our festival represents the best of New York City, embracing New York's diversity, protecting queer refugees and asylum seekers, and providing affordable, high quality entertainment to residents and visitors across the city. However, we have lost almost all of our funding for this vital program. $50,000 from the New York City Mayor's Grant for Cultural Impact, part of the CREATE NYC plan, which vanished after the pandemic budget cuts. How does the city decide to cut cultural impact at a time when our cultural institutions are threatened with extinction and our industry faces 66% unemployment? We just became eligible for DCLA funding, but now the agency is not accepting new competitive applications. And I wish the Commissioner had stayed to hear this because it's very hard for organizations like ours. Support for queer and artists of color from the city council means resources. We need more funding for our small queer arts organizations and organizations of color as we serve the city's most vulnerable residents through grassroots community organizing. We know how to support our communities best. We implore you to properly fund our city's small queer and arts organizations of color to bring about a truly equitable environment through which your artists can flourish in a city 
the queer and cultural capital of the country. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next witness will be Douglas Dubois Card, Sebamala from National Queer Theater. Time starts now. Douglas, you're still on mute. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Douglas Dubois Card, Sebamala, the managing director at National Queer Theater. In this room, as in major theaters across New York City, I am one among very few black, queer, immigrant managing directors, if not the only one. Our queer and BIPOC communities are hungry for representation. We deserve a seat at the table of decision makers to shape the narratives of our generation and generations coming after us through community leadership and transformational power of theater. The formative years of my youth were spent in Uganda surrounded by anti-gay discrimination and stigma. The government passed the Anti-Homosexuality Bill of 2014, which called for a death sentence for all gay people in the country. When I moved to America, I was no stranger to police brutality. Our communities experience major trauma every day with unwarranted policing of people of color and brutal shootings of unarmed black men and women in our homes and on the streets. We need your protection and support. At National Queer Theater, we bring to the fore experiences of queer and BIPOC artists through social justice theater and theater education programming. We want our voices to be heard, for our stories to be told, and not told from single narratives and perspectives, but through our undiluted lived experiences as queer, Black, Indigenous people of color in America. But that starts with you giving us a seat at the table this table. By funding our initiatives and all queer BIPOC-led organizations, you enable our work to uplift our communities, contribute to our strife for equality through social justice and programs against marginalization of our people. I implore you to visit our website at National Queer Theater to support our festival that starts on 22nd to 26th of June, so that our stories ha that have been censored in countries continue to thrive among audiences who appreciate theater in the five boroughs of New York City. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The last member of this panel will be Deborah Cowell. Ms. Cowell, you may uh, begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. My name is Deborah Cow Cowell and I'm speaking um, on behalf of myself, my partner, Katie Madison, and our community arts network. When artists first looked to the stars, the result was astronomy and eventually traveled through space. The gift to us, Mae Jemison. When the artists looked to the human body, the result was medicine and common cures. The development of the sciences was for the longest time integrally attached to music and poetry. It was through rhyme and song that theory and science was with discipline taught and remembered. We are here now talking about how to save the arts as a direct result of the systemic compartmentalization of the human spirit. In 1984, Mabel Hampton addressed the New York City Gay Pride Rally and said, I am proud of myself and my people. I would like all my people to be free in this world, my gay people and, black, and my black people. Empirical fact, empirical fact, black queer artists are responsible for the artistic and cultural impact of the Harlem Renaissance. And yet, in 1923, the New York Age reported that the average Black worker earned $25 per month and spent one half to two thirds of these monthly wages on rent. The report also stated that Black tenants generally paid twice as much for rent as, the white New York, as their white New York counterparts. Nothing has changed. Black and brown New Yorkers are paying disproportionately more in rent in relation to their wages than their white counterparts. We cannot live in and then be expected to create in these conditions. The Human Rights Campaign Foundation published a study wherein they stated anti-transgender stigma, denial of opportunity, and increased risk factors compound to create cult a culture of violence disproportionately impacting trans and gender non-conforming people of color. What should not get lost on any of us is 
is the fact that conversations around the preservation of the arts in New York City resonate differently now because we are in the midst of the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance. It's no small thing that the conditions of a pandemic and fiscal uncertainty are also the same. At the very same time, the Museum of Modern Art is aware of these times and has no problem displaying, displaying art from that era on its walls in rotating fashion, which lets us know that somebody somewhere knows something about what this time is reflective of. So what are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna make this better? New York City is not teeming with artists the way it used to because it is no longer affordable to simply just live here. What we are acutely aware of in any conversation having to do with putting funds back into the arts community is the enormous degree to which the word artist is consistently read as synonymous for white. And whenever any mention of black and brown people is made, it is essentially lip service. Inevitably, inevitably one position gets set aside for a whole bunch of people to compete for, and that one person has to bear the weight of being the standard bearer. And when they break, they're used as the example for why these programs don't work. The same holds true for any conversation about queerness. The default is always to whiteness if the conversation about queerness comes up at all. And it is both depressing and enraging at the same time. Because we are Black love. women and, and also part of the LGBTQIA plus community, what we say here should be read from that, that perspective with that in mind first. Because some of us remember what New York City used to feel like growing up surrounded by all kinds of culture beyond Apple stores, Whole Foods, H&M, and H&M. We are tired of the conversations being a talking point for the re-election of elected officials, all the while being set up for our failure. So much of the basic infrastructure that was in place that made it possible for artists to thrive is now gone. And it's frustrating to watch New York City try to build up a tourism, build up tourism on a reality of what used to be. When de Blasio was running for mayor for the first time, one of the promises he made was to establish affordable housing for artists. It's the reason many of us voted for him. That promise has fallen by the wayside. What we need is a plan for artists that provides spaces to create with a set of deliverables attached that can be spaced out incrementally to ensure the that the demonstration of progress is beneficial for both the artists, the program supporting them, and the rest of New York City. We cannot have this discussion without talking about the institution, without talking about institutional homophobia. We will not have this conversation without coming out and saying point blank, all of this has become the culture of the city of New York, of the city of New York. And as writers, it makes us mad as hell because we should be talking about so many other things instead. We have to be talking about so many other things instead. But here we are once again, a demonstration of the fact that we can do so many other things at the same time. We just need to be doing better. A lot has got to change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Brenda. Go ahead. Uh, so thank you very much all uh, for uh, your your testimony and uh, and your work uh, and your challenge. Uh, I wanted to ask Douglas um, a question, if we can unmute. Uh, Douglas, about um, the funding that you you do receive uh, and uh, where it comes from, and your interaction with the Department of Cultural Affairs, in particular, uh, and the, the the city funding streams, if you will. Yes, I would love to speak to that, but I'm going to request that Adam um, takes on the Adam Otsisruben, who's artistic director. Um, but I'll say that we recently applied to um, the DCLA funding, um, but our previous uh, contributions have been coming in from individual donors. We have a, a partnership with Stonewall Foundation, and then Adam will speak to our other streams of funding. Yeah, thank you, Douglas. So last year, we were a sub-grantee of Dixon Place in the Lower East Side and received the Mayor's Grant for Cultural Impact for $50,000 for our annual Criminal Queerness Festival, which is promoting international and immigrant uh, LGBTQ artists. Um, that program was supposed to be re renewable for a year to 2021. We had to do our festival on Zoom last year. We're doing it outdoors this year. And when we approached uh, DCLA about the second year of the program, they said the program no longer exists because of pandemic budget cuts. So when we applied for DCLA funding, uh, just last week, I believe, or the week before, um, they said they're not accepting new competitive applications. We're limited to city uh, council funding. And this is our first year 
as a three-year-old organization that were eligible for DCLA funding. So we based half of our budgeting on being newly eligible for DCLA funding. And this year, because of COVID, they say that uh, there is no DCLA funding for organizations like ours, a queer, diverse organization. So, you know, really, as we approach Pride season, our busy season of the year, we're extremely underfunded and under-resourced by the government. So uh, that's really disappointing um, to hear. Uh, uh, you may or may not know I'm I'm one of only four queer council members uh, in the city council, um, and uh, you know I, I uh, will definitely uh, speak to uh, Commissioner Casals and uh, um, and and see you know what we can do. Uh, obviously. Uh, many of you spoke to uh, the issues around homophobia and uh, uh, the underrepresentation that the LGBTQ community faces uh, in terms of funding. So um, that's particularly painful to hear in terms of your experience with getting 50 and then having it pulled and yanked right back. Um, uh, that's 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 devastating. I'm sure that's uh, a fairly significant grant for you all, right? Um, yeah, and you know, we want to put money into the pockets of our artists who are mostly queer immigrant artists, um, especially as people have been out of work for a year in the theater community. So as we try to bring back theater safely and employ LGBTQ artists and especially queer artists of color, uh, we really need that government support um, from the city council and also DCLA in order to get people back to work and bring back the arts and culture to, to New York City. Uh, thank you. Um, we should definitely uh, be in some communication. Um, and uh, Melody and Deborah, thank you, Melody. Obviously, uh, uh, you always bring uh, some truth and, and uh, uh, incredible passion uh, and uh, uh, you have for as, as long as we've been uh, uh, doing this work uh, in the same space. Uh, and uh, you are always challenging all of us as you should uh, and, uh, and calling injustice out uh, at every turn. So um, I just want to appreciate you uh, and, uh, um, and the, the role that you play here, which is a particularly fierce one, if I might uh, use that term. Um, and, and Deborah, thank you very much for um, your contributions here. And, um, you know, we've had whole hearings about the topic of uh, uh, housing insecurity, real estate, uh, uh, pricing out of artists, uh, particularly um, artists of, of color and uh, gentrification. But uh, all of those things that you raised are, are real uh, and important, um, among others. So want to thank uh, each of you um, for being here. If there are any other council members who have questions for this panel, feel free to raise your hand. If not, we will move on to the next panel and I'll throw it right back to Brenda to facilitate. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. Um, we're not seeing any hands, so I'm jumping in. Just checking one more time if any council members have questions for the panel. We're not seeing any hands, so we'll move to the next panel. All right, well, thank you. So thank you to our first panel. The next panel, so we'll move to panel two, that panel in order of speaking will be Cheryl Warfield from More Opera, Alejandra Duque Cifuentes from Dance NYC, Courtney French from JCal, and Adam McKinney from High Arts. So uh, we will call you one at a time. And again, please wait for the sergeant to call the clock before you begin your testimony. I will now call on Cheryl Warfield. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, uh, Majority Leader Congo, and members of City Council for the opportunity to testify. I am Cheryl Warfield, um, an African-American performing artist and leader of Advance More Opera, 501c3 um, arts organization.
providing performances and outreach to underserved audiences in New York City. I speak to you today to, one, urge the formation of new funding systems to provide equity for BIPOC and queer artists and artist-led organizations rendering services to underserved New York communities, but not eligible for DCLA funding. Two, to change the grant awarding system to provide greater equity and sustainability for BIPOC programming. Three, to support increased funding for CASA and SUCASA initiatives uh, to underserved communities. And four, to inform city council that artists and cultural organizations never stopped providing services during the pandemic and to heighten awareness that many smaller organizations like mine in the trenches increased services to help our communities in this great time of need. The reality is that under current funding model, models and granting mechanisms, neither I as an independent artist for over 30 years, nor my 20 year old BIPOC organization will see a penny of the multi-millions of anticipated federal dollars that will be distributed. There needs to be a more equitable way to distribute city council funds and I urge city council members to identify all artists in their own communities. Artists live in every part of New York City, from Wall Street to unfortunately homeless shelters. New York City needs a vision and a plan to put artists back to work and provide a living wage to pull artists out of the poverty level. Throughout the pandemic, arts and culture has never stopped. My organization pivoted to online programming, and thanks to Ben Spearman at the Bronx Opera and the Jazz of Van Cortland Senior Center Administration for valuing and sustaining a senior chorus program that originated through Sukasa, I have continued working virtually with Bronx seniors for over 13 months. Now is the time for our leaders in government to be forward thinking and to plan effectively for reopening and stimulating the economy with arts initiatives, being mindful of new and pandemic related expenses for organizations and time expired. Increase artists pay to keep up with inflation. New York has been advantaged by a strong arts and cultural landscape for decades. Let New York City be a guiding light for bringing back culture by valuing all of its artists and cultural organizations, thus renewing and restoring itself to its rightful place as a mecca for worldwide culture. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. The next witness will be Alejandra Duque Cifuentes. Time starts now. Thank you, it wouldn't let me unmute. Um, hello folks, my name is Alejandra Duque Cifuentes. I'm the executive director of Dance NYC and I represent dance artists, workers, cultural organizations and businesses. Um, I'm coming to offer testimony, really requesting things that I've been requesting in multiple testimonies across the past year um, and several years. First, to acknowledge the ongoing lasting impacts of slavery and settler colonialism by establishing and executing a plan to it address those impacts and repair the harm done by establishing a commission for reparations for past and continuing harms inflicted upon black and indigenous peoples from colonialism to slavery through food and housing redlining, mass incarceration and surveillance. Second, to prioritize funding to black indigenous folks of the global majority, immigrant, dis disabled and LGBTQ plus arts and cultural organizations in order to decenter Eurocentrism and white supremacy in Main Street New York culture, cultural representation, in order to begin to undo the pejorative and hurtful narratives and depictions and associations with those communities and cultures. Uh, substantial investment is needed in order for those organizations that authentically represent, primarily serve, are led by or founded by these communities to thrive. Third, to establish funding to ensure that BIPOC 
immigrant, disability, and LGBTQ organizations and artists can own and properly maintain their venues, buildings, and or land, recognizing land stewardship and ownership as one of the most significant ways to address systemic inequitable distribution of resources. Four, to ensure that funding streams created to support these communities and cultural organizations are streamlined for multi-year support providing expansive technical assistance to facilitate the application process and award sizes that actually allow for the payment of dignified wages to those arts and cultural workers. And lastly, and very importantly and timely, to ensure that federal relief funds that are received by the city prioritize both in their allotment and in their distribution mechanisms, those communities um, as specifically independent arts workers and small budget organizations to ensure that most, those most impacted by COVID and continued systemic injustice are able to access that needed support and services quickly. We cannot have dense, difficult application processes that are based on who is already getting funds, who is already well connected, who already knows how to get those funds, because people are dying, our cultural organizations are closing, our workers are fleeing the city, and the communities that make New York City great are going to disappear if we do not invest in them. We know that our budgets are investments, and not just a line item in the budget, I'm but also by. the mechanisms for how we distribute money are a reflection of the values that we have as an organ as organizations, as a city, and as a community. So I thank you all for listening, and I hope that to work with you to establish some mechanisms for for healthy support of our communities. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next witness on this panel will be Courtney French. From J. Kell and Mr. French, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Thank you and good morning. I am here today to give testimony about amplifying the voices of BIPOC and queer communities in our cultural institutions. I come to you today inspired by the philosophy of Ubuntu. I am because we are. We are a city of an expanding convergence of diversity multiple languages, undulating perspectives, and a fierce hunger to be heard. Black indigenous people of color and queer voices can be found on stages, in front of cameras, behind microphones, and even in executive offices. What is really, what is not readily accessible are opportunity, opportunities to decide what content populates our airwaves. Theater, TV, cinema, and the myriad of digital gateways we have all grown to accept as standard mediums. My name is Courtney French. I have worked in the arts, culture, and education industry in the, over the past 20 years. I'm a dancer, choreographer, writer, educator, and currently the artistic director for the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning. The initiative I would like to propose is based on a pilot program initiated with the help of the New York Community Trust partnership with the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning called Building Equity. Building Equity, Equity was developed as a two-year program that creates an advisory council made up of queer, Black, Indigenous people of color. The council is tasked with the creation of presentation of programmatic ideas and events that are directly driven by their collective cultural and community interests. The council works directly with the CIG, in this case, the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, or JCAL. JCAL provides all material support, access to creative space, technical assistance, marketing and promotion, stipends, and administrative assistance. All of this is done, of course, with the help of a funder, in this case, New York Community Trust. The programs created through the council have gone on, gone in directions we never dreamed of films on the essential invisibility of indigenous population in the city, exhibits on queer South Asian arts and lectures on Taino, Taino culture, actually um, topics we would have never explored had it not been for this particular council. It is my professional experience that programming generated by the institutions are often called on what is considered the norm, whatever was done last year and the year before that. The lineage of programming can be traced to a time when the Eurocentric ideal or white dominant culture was the only lens through which art was seen. That was not too much, there was not too much room for other voices. 
It is imperative that we take a revolutionary turn and develop more funding streams to programs that are driven by the voiceless and the underserved. We are here today standing with freedoms and liberties that many before us didn't have, some of whom we don't know, have never celebrated, but did the work quietly and often without time expired. We are who we are today because of them. I close as I began, Ubuntu. I am because we are. We must amplify the voices of Black, queer, Indigenous people of color in our community. Thank you. My name is Courtney French. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we have one more witness on this panel. The last witness will be Adam McKinney from High Arts. Mr. McKinney, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Good morning. I am Aaron L. McKinney, Interim Executive Director of High Arts, located at El Barrio's Art Space, PS 109 in East Harlem. Charlie Smalls penned a song for one of my favorite musicals, The Wiz. It begins, when I think of home, I think of a place where there's love overflowing. I would add that when I think of home, I think of a place where I am safe to be full, to be my full self. But where can Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, other people of color, queer, and other historically marginalized artists call home? Are there enough safe spaces that allow these artists to bring their full selves to their art? High arts is one of those safe spaces, both literally and metaphorically, for marginalized communities to share their stories. We are a leading cultural hub within the urban arts movement. For over 20 years, we have provided unique development opportunities to artists of color, always placing issues of equity and social justice at the forefront. We invite our artists to bring their full selves and our staff to do the same. While many organizations only devo devote resources to late stage work, we invest in the development phase of artistic creation rather than a final product. For artists of the global majority, especially those in hip hop and the urban arts, this kind of support is rarely afforded. Development takes time. Our artists need this time with pay. Additionally, we work with our artists to design residencies that are tailored to their specific needs. Many are used to catering to the aesthetic or structural norms of white led institutions. High arts residencies subvert this structure, asking artists to tell us what they need and providing it. We have heard time and again from our artists that this sets us apart from many other institutions. I want to take a moment to discuss this word institution. There have been long tensions between artists and institutions. For many, those power dynamics reached a breaking point in this past year. There are countless stories, some documented, mostly undocumented, of artists who comment they never want to work with an institution again. The trickle down system from institutions to artists isn't working and the safety net is fragile at best. The COVID pandemic highlighted these failures that we know are not new. In 2020, Americans for the Arts found that 62% of artists, of arts and cultural workers were unemployed and more than 69% were black, indigenous and other POC. As leaders of organizations, as leaders in government, we need to provide direct financial support to our artists and cultural workers during this emergency and on an ongoing basis. For me, it will always be about process over product, artist over art, human being over funded deliverable. When our residencies, exhibits, and productions are over, it means everything when artists tell us that they felt loved and supported or that they want to work with High Arts team again. Developing those relationships with and building pipelines for historically marginalized artists is the reason why we do what we do. We thank Chairman Van Bramer and the members of the committee, Commissioner Consols and DCLA and the city at large for its partnership. Let's work harder, provide resources and continue to make New York home for these artists. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you. Oops, sorry, sorry, no, Brenda. Chair Van Bramer. Uh, uh, thank you to all of the members of this panel. Uh, Alejandro, I just wanna say I uh, support the Commission on Reparations uh, uh, legislation that you, you spoke of. Council member Ines Barron has uh, introduced a, a resolution along those lines. I think there are, there are some others as well. Um, and uh, I just checked uh, to make sure that I was a co-sponsor of the uh, Commission on Reparations that uh, Councilmember Barron uh, has has proposed. So um, thank you for raising that uh, today. And um, I am officially signed on as a co-sponsor um, of that. Um, and 
Um, and, and I just want to thank uh, everyone on the panel, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Courtney French for your uh, work in Queens. Um, uh, obviously, I greatly appreciate uh, J-Cal uh, and all that it means um, to, to this borough um, and uh, to everyone uh, you serve and work with. Um, and, you know, I was thinking as, as all of you were speaking, Aaron, Cheryl, who's uh, been at our, our hearings before, you know, we've been talking a lot about these issues this past year. Uh, and sometimes uh, it feels very frustrating, I'm sure, uh, uh, for uh, Alejandra and Cheryl in particular, who have been here many times, uh, obviously Melody uh, as well. Um, but uh, I do feel like we keep, uh, we need to keep uh, uh, talking about this and having hearings about this, because uh, if we don't, you know, it just doesn't get spoken about, right? It just doesn't um, uh, even make it um, uh, into the, the dialogue here at the council in the ways that it needs to be. So um, I, I just appreciate uh, your, your persistence um, in, in coming uh, and, and speaking uh, truth to power all the time. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I thank you all. Um, and uh, Cheryl, thank you again for the incredible gift you gave uh, to, to my mother, uh, which was incredibly uh, uh, generous and sweet. Um, so I, I think we have no other questions or comments from uh, members, um, but thank you. Um, and uh, Aaron, this is the first time I believe we've met. Um, at least in, in this uh, bizarre virtual world capacity situation. Um, but uh, uh, just your, your, your energy came through um, uh, very profoundly um, and, and thank you for uh, your work. I was once uh, there um, many years ago, but uh, greatly appreciate um, everything that you brought to the hearing today. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer, and also to the members of the panel. Um, so we will now move to panel three, and um, I'll read that panel in order and then call you individually. The members of panel three will be Evans Richardson from the Studio Museum in Harlem, Stephanie Cunningham from Museum Hugh, and Anna Chirino from El Museo del Barrio. Um, so we will next move to Evans Richardson, Mr. Richardson, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Thank you, and Chair Van Bramer and the members of the committee on behalf of the entire board, staff, and extended community at the Studio Museum in Harlem, I want to express our sincere gratitude for inviting us to participate in this critical conversation on, amplify, on amplifying BIPOC voices in the cultural sphere. My name is Evans Richardson, Chief of Staff at the Studio Museum in Harlem, where for over half a century we have committed ourselves to the study, presentation, and conservation of the work of artists of African descent. In the 52 years since our founding, our mission has been to uplift our community and bear witness to Black life through art and culture. The Studio Museum is a proud member of the Cultural Institutions Group and as such is committed to supporting the public health, public life, and public service of all New Yorkers and of the city itself. Our commitment to the art and artists of African descent has only deepened since March 2020 when the museum made its transition to remote work. Today I want to celebrate for a few, moment, for a few moments the accomplishments of BIPOC organizations of which the Studio Museum is just one example, who have been able to create new opportunities for audience engagement and amplify the voices of artists across the five boroughs and indeed the world. One example of this work is the museum's iconic artists in residence program envisioned by artist William T. Williams. Uh, this is the program from which we get our name. This program gives emerging artists an unparalleled opportunity to develop their practice in an 11 month residency and culminates in an annual exhibition. The program has supported over 150 artists who have gone on to highly regarded careers. Individuals selected for the residency receive institutional guidance, professional development, and research support. On December 10th, we were thrilled to open our annual Artist in Residence exhibition, This Longing Vessel, at MoMA PS1. 
In its second year, this collaboration with the fellow CIG provides a promising model and exciting opportunities for cross-institutional programming and audience building. This year, we were also thrilled to present Chloe Bass Wayfinding in Harlem's St. Nicholas Park, a collaboration with NYC Parks and a part of our In Harlem initiative. Uh, this, was all, this exhibition took place from September 2019 through 2020. The exhibition, made up of site-specific sculptures, explored the st structural and visual vernacular of public wayfinding signage, resonated with viewers even as we remained physically distant. Bass's sculptures uh, activated an eloquent exploration of language, both visual and written, encouraging moments of private reflection in public space. I also uh, wanted to mention another program called Find Art Here, a collaboration that has taken our collection and uh, high quality reproduction, uh, reproductions of works from our collection and put them in public spaces such as NYCHA uh, public housing complexes uh, and uh, New York City public schools. Most recently, we worked with the Grant Houses to install a reprint of Henry Taylor's I'm, I'm... How I Got Over. Despite the challenges of the current moment, we understand that the artist the Studio Museum works to amplify will both reflect and shape this time, placing our history in a global context for future generations. We hope the outcome of our collective work in this moment will be an affirmation of the sanctity, complexity, and beauty of Black life and humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. The next witness on this panel will be Stephanie Cunningham from Museum Q. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you, and thank you, Chair Van Bramer and Commissioner Casals for your work in advocacy and members of the City Council. My name is Stephanie Johnson Cunningham. I'm the co-founder and creative director of Museum Hue, an arts organization dedicated to supporting hundreds of museum professionals in various cultural institutions across New York City's five boroughs. Museum Hue was specifically created for the advancement of Black, Indigenous, and people of color throughout the field. Museum Hue joins colleague advocates working across creative disciplines in thanking the committee for your leadership, especially during this time. The arts play an essential role in cultural and social life across New York City. The arts is how we all tell our stories, preserve our heritage, interpret the past, and imagine our future. It is a tool Black, Indigenous, and people of color have used to both amplify and transcend the oppression, injustices, and impoverishment of our communities that are, are present in the very moment. The arts are used to enrich our lives daily and has also been used as a strategy for community building and as a form of resistance. The arts are an essential part of liberation and have helped to paint a fuller, more vibrant portrait of New Yorkers across the city. And beyond this cultural impact, the arts sector is also essential to New York City's economy, generating GDP, stimulating jobs, and contributing taxes. The arts and culture sector is the number one driver of tourism to the state, generating 110 billion in economic activity, according to the Comptroller's report in the creative economy. It highlights that the vastness of the cultural sector with nearly 400,000 jobs has changed the framework of the city. But due to the pandemic, arts venues were forced to close and cancel programs due to COVID-19. So in order for the vibrancy that is New York City's arts and culture to be revived, we need the support of the city council. We know that Black, Indigenous, and people of color arts organization have been disp disproportionately impacted. Our arts and culture ecosystem needs funding to ensure the survival. So I'm recommending that the city council fund initiatives for arts organization led by and centering Black, Indigenous, and people of color, provide necessary funding in order for us to continue to support Black, Indigenous, and people of color, recognize the critical work and critical needs of Black, Indigenous, and People of Color's arts organization. And within the budget for arts and culture, there needs to be a portion dedicated to Black, Indigenous, and People of Color's arts organization. Museum Hue advocates for a vision- I'm expired. In, Museum Hue advocates for a vision rooted in racial equity and sustainability for the arts and culture industry. 
city budget and funding are needed so that arts and culture can continue to thrive in a city known and celebrated for its arts and culture. As a lifelong New Yorker and museum professional, I know firsthand the impact of the arts and cultural field. Centering Black, Indigenous, and people of color's experiences, perspectives, practices, and pedagogy creates pathways to greater recognition and representation. Visual imagery is a change agent for narratives of Black, Indigenous, and people of color's life that can affect our perceptions of justice, reshaping our understanding of society. And at a time when we are increasingly called upon to address race, the emergence of Black, Indigenous, and people of color's arts organizations embody racial justice. They are sites for the negotiation and expansion of racial histories and racial justice. Each serve as a focus point for wider ideological questions over the continued significance of race in America. They are continuously offering dynamic sites for the ongoing struggle for rights and racial justice, addressing the multi-layered issues of race from the interpretive and structural levels. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our last witness on this panel will be Ana Chirino from El Museo del Barrio. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer and the entire Cultural Affairs Committee for the opportunity to present today. I'd also like to say that I'm honored to be part of this distinguished panel, Evans and Stephanie. I think the work that your organizations are doing and yourselves are amazing. My name is Ana Chirano, Director of Government and Community Affairs at El Museo del Barrio. As a native New Yorker, Afro-Latina, and daughter of immigrants, it's a distinct honor to be able to speak on the chosen topic. Firstly, El Museo is one of 34 organizations within the CIG, the Cultural Institutions Group, that are located on city property. Throughout the pandemic, CIGs have remained committed to providing free offerings for nearly 10 million individuals. El Museo is also a member of the Latinx Arts Consortium of New York, a peer network dedicated to knowledge, ex knowledge exchange, resource sharing, and collective action towards systemic change. El Museo del Barrio, an anchor of the East Harlem community, has a 50-year grassroots legacy of amplifying Puerto Rican and Latinx voices in the arts. In fact, addressing the lack of representation of Latinx artists in the mainstream art world was a main catalyst for El Museo's creation. Recently, the art world has taken steps towards addressing a stubborn lack of inclusivity in its staffing, audiences, and content. But the work of culturally specific institutions like El Museo is still necessary and worthy of support from the city council now more than ever. A national survey found that Latinx artists represent only 2.8% of artists in museum collections in the US, 2.8%. For comparison, the 60 million Latinx people in the US are 18% of the population according to the Census Bureau, 2.8% versus 18%. In New York City, we represent almost 30% of city residents. So there's still work to be done. More recently, most recently at El Museo del Barrio, we continue to amplify Latinx voices, which by the way, include black and queer Latinx voices with a recent exhibition, Estamos Bien, La Triennal 2021, the museum's first ever national large scale survey of contemporary art featuring more than 40 artists. Art writer Barbara Calderon, when reviewing the show for Artnet, mentioned that La Triennale shows how much latent and underrecognized talent there is in the field. The exclusion of Latinx art from relevant art conversations is a reality. That persistent exclusion in museum collections, gallery shows, et cetera, is a running testament to the need for surveys like in museos. She continues, the collected works are but a glimpse into the range of Latinx art, the curators have outlined a communal need for doing justice to its breath. It's up to the rest of the art world to respond. I would add to Barbara's last words that it is also up to our partners in government to respond by supporting the organizations that are correcting the art canon so that it more accurately reflects the beautiful cacophony of who we are as a city and a nation. We need your support to continue doing this work. I don't need to tell this committee that arts and cultural organizations will play an essential role in our recovery, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that without intensified support, 
many organizations may have to close their doors permanently. This is especially true for arts organizations led by and serving communities of color that have been historically underfunded. The DeVos Institute reported in its 2015 study of diversity in the arts that the 20 largest mainstream organizations have a median budget of 61 million and the 20 largest organizations of color have a median budget size of 3.8 million. To quote the Ford Foundation, this difference of 16 times in median budget size is a glaring illustration of disparity. Additionally, many funding opportunities such as the federal SVOG and PPP grants are not a level playing field either shut out and they either shut out small nonprofits or do not address barriers to applying such as needs for technical assistance, which especially affect BIPOC organizations. We also need to be supported as we ramp up our reopening and as we are now operating at massively decreased revenue streams with an uncertain fundraising future. It's time to acknowledge and truly honor the diversity of artistic expression and excellence in our city and provide critical funding to organizations and communities that have made a significant impact on our cultural landscape, despite historically limited resources. We look forward to working together to ensure adequate funding for the entire art sector and search for innovations that guarantee equitable funding in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to uh, everyone on this panel. Um, uh, Evans, thank you for the partnership uh, with MoMA PS1, uh, which uh, is in my district. And uh, we're very, very uh, thrilled to see um, the collaboration there. Um, incredible. Um, and uh, of course, you know, we love uh, Studio uh, Museum Harlem um, and uh, El Museo uh, as well. Uh, and, and thank you, Stephanie, for, um, and all of you, but Stephanie in particular, for talking about the need to uh, develop more and increase the existing funding streams that we do have that are dedicated um, uh, to Black, Indigenous, uh, uh, people of color, and queer led organizations. Um, and we've the commissioner we talked a little bit about some, I talked a little bit about some, so we've got Coalition of Theories of Color, um, the Cultural Immigrant Initiative, but those are very uh, small pockets relative to the, the larger uh, funding picture. And uh, the commissioner also mentioned some other um, uh, attempts and, and I think some, some good stuff where there's, there's some equity um, built in, but, but clearly we're just just touching the the surface right we're just starting um so uh i appreciate all of uh, the work that you all do and um and for being here today to um remind us of the work ahead all right thank you chair van bramer we don't have any hands raised from other council members so um if you are okay moving to the next panel we can move to panel four this will be the final panel for this hearing today. Um, so as with the previous panels, we'll read all the names of the panelists and then call people one by one. You may begin testimony after the sergeant calls the clock. Um, so thank you again to panel three and our other panels. Um, and we will now move to our final panel. The members of the final panel will be Freddie Tavares from the New York Historical Society, Richard Burns, also from New York Historical, and Lucy Sexton from New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts. Uh, so, Mr. Tavares, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. I think Freddie needs to be unmuted. There we go. Dear members of the Committee on Cultural Affairs and everybody else here, um, I am Freddie Taveras. I'm the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of the New York Historical Society Museum and Library. Thank you for the continued support um, and continued service to the arts and cultural community in New York City, particularly during these challenging times. And thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony on behalf of the New York Historical Society. New York Historical aims to be an active, accessible community resource and destination for audiences typically underserved by cultural institutions. Some of our past exhibitions include Art as Activism, which showcased protest art from the 1930s through the 1970s, including that of the Black Panther movement, 
Nueva York, which told the history of the Latino presence in New York from the 1600s through World War II, and Chinese American, Exclusion, Inclusion, which explored the centuries long history of the Chinese immigrant experience. Our groundbreaking traveling exhibition, Black Citizenship in the Age of Jim Crow, will be on view at the Bullock Texas State History Museum in June. Our aim is to ensure that our museum professionals hail from a wide range of backgrounds. So we can create museum programming that highlights underrecognized stories, challenges, hegemonic historical narratives, and enriches public understanding of our shared past. In addition to our diverse staff, our Frederick Douglass Council and Women's History Council affinity groups promote deeper discussion and engagement by encouraging support for programming that enriches and advances the knowledge and documentation of Black history and women's history. To ensure BIPOC and queer voices are included in museum conversations, the New York Historical Society has assembled recently a Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Committee open to all employees. New York Historical is committed to amplifying BIPOC and queer voices, not only at the museum, but in the arts and culture field in general. As such, since 2019, we've been partners with the City University of New York's School of Professional Studies to offer a very successful Master of Arts in Museum Studies degree program. It's a unique collaboration designed with the goal to diversify the city's museum workforce and address the needs of our increasingly diverse museum going public. The master's program was launched to address the pervasive, pervasive lack of accessibility and inclusion in the American Museum leadership staff, working towards generating an equitable and sustainable cultural workforce of tomorrow. The program is specifically structured to attract and retain students from non-traditional academic backgrounds. I'm expired. And we are pleased to offer scholarship funds for qualifying students. In closing, I can't, I can't uh, not say this. Um, New York Historical has and continues to partner with the American LGBTQ plus museum to bring forth plans to construct the city's first major museum dedicated to LGBTQ plus history and culture. This new museum will be housed in a dedicated floor of the New York Historical Society's planned expansion, which has received generous funding from the city, council, and the administration in the last two fiscal years. This partnership represents a vital part of our institutional mission, and we look forward to offering robust programming on LGBTQ plus history and culture to New York City. Thank you very much. I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you so much for your testimony. The next speaker will be Richard Burns. Mr. Burns, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Hi there. Um, my name is indeed Richard Burns, and I am the chair of the board of the Developing American LGBTQ Plus Museum. It's a museum to come of history and culture here in New York City. The concept of a queer history museum in New York has been talked about for over 20 years, and there have been a couple of efforts that have come and gone. Elsewhere around the world, there is a significant LGBTQ history museum in Berlin. There is an effort underway in London called Queer Britain. And there are small LGBTQ history museums already open in San Francisco and in Fort Lauderdale. In addition, there are numerous LGBTQ archives around the country. The one archive in Los Angeles is the oldest and largest. While here in New York City, we have the Lesbian Herstory Archives in Brooklyn, the LGBT archive at the LGBT Community Center, and the archive at the Cornell Sexuality Collection in Ithaca. In 2017, about five years ago, a group of LGBTQ activists came together to begin conversations to create a museum here in New York City. And our first decision was to assemble a team that reflects the true diversity of New York's queer communities before any specifics or visioning got started. With early seed support from the New York City Council and the New York Community Trust, 
pro bono legal support from the law firm Brian Cave, we were able to secure our museum charter from the New York City Board of New York State Board of Regents in 2019. And we engaged a museum planning firm, AK Consulting, to do deep research. What, do our, what does our communities need and want in a queer history museum? There were interviews with LGBTQ historians, academics, leaders around the country, focus groups in English, Spanish, and Russian in all five boroughs, talks with museum leaders and experts, and we engaged a consumer research firm to do an online survey of over 40,000 LGBTQ people. We incorporated data, tourism data, from NYC and Co. on LGBT travelers to New York, and all of this came together to create a vision for a queer museum here in New York City. Our goal is to create a museum for people who might not be comfortable in traditional museums in New York. We want it to be both physical and digital, home to school children and researchers, New Yorkers and tourists. Museums can take a long time to happen. And so in late 2019, we developed our partnership with the New York Historical Society. New York Historical Society President Louise Mirror and her team have very generously agreed to incubate our museum effort, and we hope that's the case for many, many years. We're working now with curators at the Historical okay. Society in our first programming. We've undertaken this effort with a volunteer board of directors of 24 activists, and our team includes folks who have helped create the New York City AIDS Memorial Park, the designation of the Stonewall National Monument by President Obama and the LGBT Community Center. All of these uh, efforts are not simply to record, explain, and celebrate and commemorate, commemorate the stories and struggles of our people and the path to change that we've all made together. Our goal is really to inspire rising generations with these histories to future activism all the progress that we as people have achieved is very, very fragile and is under assault around the country by the right wing. Rising generations need to have access to this history so that they can lead forward armed with the lessons, mistakes and victories that we older folks have lived. We thank the council for its strong support and ask for continued support. New York is the right place, the right home for this museum this springboard for activism towards justice and equality. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we have one more witness and one more panelist. As a reminder, we will check for anyone that we inadvertently missed after this panel. So if you have not heard your name, don't worry. Um, we will check afterwards. But the final member of panel four and our final witness is Lucy Sexton from New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts and the Daily Culture at Three Call. Uh, Ms. Sexton, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Sounds so ominous, the final witness. Uh, thank you very much. I am Lucy Sexton of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. Um, thank you, Chair Van Bramer and members of the City Council for this important and urgent hearing. When we talk about raising the visibility of BIPOC, queer, and other marginalized artists, we have to talk about money. It is this historic and intentional underfunding of Black and immigrant communities that makes those voices so hard to hear. It is the long held fear of funding radical queer voices that keeps them out of the mainstream. I think we need to talk about a reimagining of New York City, one with arts and culture supported in all communities, one that invests in the economic and emotional recovery of every neighborhood, one that raises up the voices of those still suffering all kinds of oppression. It is time to be bold with our budget and intentional in laying the groundwork for a equitable, just, diverse and thriving city. The benefits of arts and culture bring, uh, extend far beyond economics. As I've said in many hearings, data shows that neighborhoods with cultural assets have improved outcomes in education, aging, mental health, youth engagement with criminal justice, community strength and safety. Yet what are the neighborhoods lacking in cultural assets even before the pandemic? economically disadvantaged and historically black, brown and immigrant sections of our city. Arts East New York, one of the few cultural organizations in Eastern Brooklyn has closed. We must direct investment to those neighborhoods now if we are to lift up the voices of those communities. 
we are at a pivotal, pivotal moment in our city's history. As we emerge from this crisis, a crisis that has devastated the cultural sector across the board, we must not simply refill the buckets of funding that existed before. We must find new ways for funding to flow. In recent years, the council has worked hard to increase the support of culture and we are grateful. Right now, arts and culture are hanging on by a thread most cultural organizations remain partially or wholly shuttered. More than half our workforce remains unemployed and the organizations most at risk are the ones most dependent on public funding, organizations disproportionately led by and serving BIPOC communities that have been hardest hit by all aspects of this crisis. I'm asking that we intentionally invest in parts of our ecosystem most likely to disappear. We can do this via existing structures, like providing long overdue stability for the coalition of theaters of color by baselining its funding. The uncertainty of funding year to year is destabilizing to its 52 member organizations. I will also add my support of Melody Capote's call to expand the CIG to include many more black, Latinx, Asian and indigenous organizations. We must also find new to initiate and support. We cannot come out of this ter terrible time with a cultural landscape that is more white, more homogenous, and more centralized than it was before. We need to act decisively to fund and lift up voices in every community of our city. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy. And as the final witness, um, uh, appreciate you uh, um, uh, delivering such powerful uh, testimony uh, as always, and um, your leadership uh, um, of a, a really diverse uh, community um, that uh, doesn't always uh, agree on on how we move forward, but you you play a real instrumental role um, in in keeping us all uh, together. Um, uh, and I, I want to thank uh, uh, the New York Historical Society, um, uh, uh, Louise uh, uh, has done some great things uh, with uh, that institution. And I think um, uh, the partnership with uh, Richard, you and your organization um, is is brilliant on so many levels and uh, and so and so needed um, and uh, and I, I really really hope we can make this happen and uh, and do it as quickly as possible. Um, there there does need to be a museum uh, for uh, the the telling and the sharing of uh, LGBTQ uh, and queer history. Um, uh, and uh, and this seems like a really, really terrific way to accomplish it and get it done. So, um, so thank you, Richard, for you and your your team, and obviously your your long history of uh, of activism on behalf of LGBTQ uh, folks, um, including, as I mentioned to you, you know, privately, while you didn't know it, when I came out of the closet as a gay 19 year old with nowhere to go um i found uh, the gay and lesbian youth of new york at the center uh and uh that safe space allowed uh, me and lots of other queer uh youth um uh um to find a, a home right and uh, also in that building to be exposed to act up and queer nation and all of this amazing uh uh, activists who I, I was uh, intimidated by, but but who I uh, often sat in the back of the room and listened to and learned from, and and that's sort of the beauty of the center, right? And uh, and that that period of uh, the late '80s and early '90s when uh, um, so many people were dying of AIDS, um, and uh, um, and there were still so many uh, um, young people who were at Hedrick Martin. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so many uh, black and brown queer kids and, and trans uh, youth who, uh, who also um, 
had few places uh, to turn to, um, but uh, your work at the center uh, is much appreciated. And I just want to say that for the record, because uh, it meant a lot to, to me in my early life and also to so many others. So uh, so thank you all uh, for, for being here. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Melody. I see you um, uh, staying through to the end and listening to, uh, to all of this. Um, and needless to say, uh, I support uh, a more inclusive and diverse uh, SIG um, and, uh, and more additions, um, uh, but uh, we will continue uh, that battle. And, uh, and Lucy, yes, uh, money does matter <laughs> and what we do with it matters and where it goes matters. And so we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So, um, with that, I will thank all of you. Um, we have uh, a few more months until this particular budget is adopted. Uh, and yes, it will be the last one that uh, uh, I uh, will be the chair of cultural affairs uh, for. Uh, and the last one that majority leader Cumbo will be a part of as, the, uh, as uh, a member of the city council, but uh, we will uh, all get, um, to fight one more time together on behalf of all of the things that we care about. So thank you. Uh, and I think uh, Brenda will uh, sort of go through some of the logistics to close us out. But uh, after that, we will adjourn the hearing. Yes, thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer, and thank you everyone for, um, for your testimony. So at this point, we have concluded the public testimony portion of our hearing. However, if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Um, raise your hand and we'll call on you that in the order that your hand is raised. Uh, so we'll just take us a moment. If anyone is logged in and we inadvertently missed you. Chair, we are not seeing any hands. Um, so at this point, we have concluded the public testimony portion of this hearing. Great, thank you very much. This hearing is officially adjourned.